All right, choir baton listeners, this is going to be one of those clickbaity titled shows, but I mean it. And that is, I want you to consider changing your holiday rehearsals with this one tweak. And I'm so excited to dive right in and share it with you. Welcome to the choir baton a podcast designed to engage with people and stories, ideas, and inspirations stemming from choir. No other art form, no sport, no hobby, no business requires a group of people to execute a communal goal with just their voices. Join me, your host, Beth Philemon, as I interview guests who are singers, teacher conductors, instrumentalists, and community members. Together, we'll ask questions, seek understanding, and share insight from our experiences in life and in choir. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Choir Baton podcast. We have taken uh, some time away, um, intentionally and unintentionally, but that is the beauty of being able to kind of do your own thing is that you can make it fit to your schedule uh, to a certain extent. So I have missed uh, doing this and I'm excited to be back and excited to bring you new interviews for 2022, which is crazy to believe that we are actually about to be in 2022. I uh, want to share with you about a couple things that are going to be up and coming in the new year, new courses uh, coming from Choir Baton. Make sure you check out the show notes for more information on those. And I'm all about getting more people singing, especially amidst the world we are living in right now, because even though I know that it's difficult for us to look and see uh, what is happening in the world around us and how often, unfortunately, a lot of times our arts programs have really suffered through class numbers with the pandemic, the humanity of what we do as musicians, as artists is still incredibly relevant one might say even more relevant um, as we see continued videos of people singing together as we saw when people weren't singing together but singing online together like we still are involved in an incredibly relevant powerful and moving art form and we have made it this far and we're just going to keep chugging along but that being said I wanted to share with you Uh, kind of a mix of of two different things. So truth be told, I had planned uh, two podcasts um, prior to this one to go out before Thanksgiving, but that did not happen. And so I'm going to merge them a little bit together here. Um, And and pardon me for reading some of this, if you are watching this on YouTube, but I want to make sure that I get uh, this first part of this verbatim. And what I'm about to read to you is my show notes for concert program notes, however fancy way you want to say it, from when I took my students to perform at the North Carolina Music Educators Conference in 2019. And this is one of my favorite, most memorable experiences that I've ever had because it was honestly my last time performing with a school group um, at that caliber that you know, I've had, and the music was amazing. And I went into it very intentionally uh, to be different in what, why, and how we were performing. I'm going to share a lot of that here, but I also kind of applied to perform on a bit of a whim and was going through an incredibly difficult time in my life. So this was spring uh, of 2018, and I was like super overworked by no one's accord, but my own and just exhausted and defeated. Before I tell you that, let me read the show notes that I included in the program that my students sang at the North Carolina Music Educators Conference, November of 2018 of that year. Here it is. Can the light truly be appreciated if there is no darkness? This realization came to me as I prepared these words. I was depressed and struggling with feelings of failure and inadequacy this past spring semester. 
I questioned if my expectations and, and vision were even attainable. I questioned if I had the mental, the emotional, the physical stamina for this profession. I questioned it all. The morning this darkness was at its deepest, I received the congratulatory email and invitation to sing at NCMEA. I'd submitted the Sandpipers, which is the name of the ensemble I was uh, conducting at the school I was at. I submitted the Sandpipers to sing because I wanted a high school group to perform two-part and SAB music at a state music educators conference. When you submit your application to sing at NCMEA, you include proposed repertoire. And the first piece I found was John Michael Trotta's setting of Longfellow's poem, A Psalm of Life. Now, let me be real. I first picked it because it was pretty. I also thought the scoring SSA with a solo or SSAA could feature baritones on the solo. But upon receiving the score and then unpacking the text, I realized that that text had a message that I had to share. The last two stanzas of that poem read, let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. We live in a society of up and doing. We push ourselves to achieve, to pursue, but too often we fail to stress the importance of learning to wait. I was losing sight of so much because I was focused on the product over the process. Through the conviction of this text and its application in my life, I am working every day towards the light. Looking back, I now believe my personal journey through darkness unintentionally shaped this repertoire. I want to remind you that no matter where you are, there is light to be discovered, and at times it best shows up in the waiting and in the process. These were the words I wrote in that NCMEA conference brochure. And I was coming out of a series of major depression, major self-doubt, and quite frankly, uncertainty if I was cut out for this profession. Um, the irony as I read these words now is that I know through conversations that I've had with many of you, or those of you that have also had conversations with other people, you um, are probably experiencing some of that right now with uh, how things are operating. Um, and so my spoiler alert, if you don't know my story, is that I will leave uh, the high school choral education, K-12 music education profession, um, but simultaneously not leave the profession. Um, and, and so that Cliff Notes version, right, is I taught middle and high school for 10 years and got a master's of music and choral conducting, national board teaching certification, and finally landed my dream gig at my dream high school. Um, it was even like a mile, less than a mile or right at a mile down the road from the townhouse that I had bought three or four years prior to this. Um, but despite all of this, I, I found myself like kind of miserable, even though I loved my students and loved what I was doing. And uh, I had a church job that was right down the road and I was teaching privately out of my house. And I was doing a maternity leave and teaching adjunct at a local uh, college and, and all these amazing opportunities were here. I was like, just kind of miserable because there were things that I hated about teaching and that by this point in my teaching career, I knew that changing schools would not fix it. But yet simultaneously, I love choir and I love teaching music. And I felt like I'd finally found like my groove and, and my style and had really streamlined uh, how I was teaching musicianship to singers uh, that made it approachable, attainable, really at a high level, but something that singers that had never sung before or experienced singers could both be involved in the lessons and still get something new and different out of it. And it was done in a way that um, placed a lot more ownership on them because my goal was for them to not only sing in high school, but to sing after high school. And I felt like I had this um, process of how to take kids from point A to point Z, well, maybe not Z, but like M at least, right? Um, very effectively and efficiently. And, and so, <sighs> There was a lot going on. And after that year, I'd leave the classroom and start a full-time MBA program at a local state university. And within a year and a half, here I am now working for a tech company full-time in my new dream role. Um, and so like that story is not picture perfect. And uh, there has been a, a lot of 
bleh, that has happened in those last two years that have been major ups and downs um, that I can even admit there have been things that like I, I've never questioned what I've done or why I've, I've done it, but it just has been very difficult. Um, but through it all, there is a practice that I began to do every single day um, that I practiced personally first, uh, and then I brought it into my rehearsals. And I, I've talked a lot about this before, but I think more than ever, it's re very relevant. And, and that um, is the practice of gratitude and the art of gratitude, practice of gratitude, and not just like being grateful in general, um, but, but really thinking about like daily gratitudes, what are things that are specific to the actual day that I can call out and be grateful for. Um, and what I noticed personally is that my level of anxiety uh, began to lessen. I began to see things differently. I began to appreciate the little things and these little things continue to stockpile on one another. Um, and so it, it really did, it transformed my heart and mind. And um, if you don't know this by now, I am by nature a very anxious person, very much so riddled with self-doubt and worry. Um, but, you know, there's more on that on future podcasts and, and I'm sure on past podcasts as well. Um, but again, accounting for these little things um, meant that the bigger and the harder things that I was anxious about um, held a little less weight and felt a little different. And so once I realized that this was changing my life, I wanted my students to experience the same thing. And in the 10 years I had been in the classroom at this point, the level of anxiety that I had seen within students only continued to grow and only continued to astound me. And I wanted them to realize how this little practice um, could revolutionize their hearts and minds like it had revolutionized mine. But I also knew like telling them about it was not going to help either. Um, like, like most people, right, in order for us to fully buy in into something, we have to experience it, we have to take part in something for it. And so how could I get my kids, my students to do something like this? And um, while I can't control their outward experiences, I could influence the time they had in the classroom. And so that's where I introduced daily gratitudes. And so for the last five or 10 minutes of every rehearsal, um, I would stop rehearsal and have us do our daily gratitudes. Now, what's really cool is I had a student um, that came up with a daily gratitude, like little jingle. Um, she did it all herself and, and brought it to the class and taught it. And every single class um, learned the jingle. And we would sing, you know, hey there choir, it's the end of the day. Now it's time for our daily gratitudes. Um, a little fun, you know, chord progression over it. And would say like uh, sandpipers say, hey there, hey sandpipers, it's the end of the day, it's time, or hey there sound, or hey there voices, uh, etc. Um, and it was, I well, ah, I have a lot of feelings just even thinking um, ab about that. Um, and so what we did was we had, I, I had one sheet of paper, and um, every student that had. Um, that wanted to could raise their hand and share daily gratitude, but it had to be specific to that rehearsal. So it wasn't anything outside of their regular day, but something specific to that rehearsal. And I would write them all down on sheets of paper. Um, and eventually I made um, like a little template, which you can go I've, in the show notes. There's one you can go and download um, a template for this to see, but I made a template of these um, that I would print them off, I'd put them in a notebook, and then, you know, I had three choirs at that time, and so each choir had their own column, and I would write down the daily gratitudes for them each, um, and it was amazing. It was amazing. Um, they were little things at times, right? Like maybe something non-musical, but you know, um, Manny was wearing this hat that I liked today, or Sarah helped me with measure 32, or I finally understood this section of that, or I felt, you know, and it could be specific to the person too, right? It didn't have to be the whole entire group. Um, or it could be something where I'm grateful for that so-and-so said something to me about what I was wearing today, or, you know, it just, they really ran the gamut. And it was the kind of thing where it was like the smaller, the better. 
and the kids um, fell in love with this practice. And when I would be absent for a day, they would make like daily gratitudes were always done. Um, if I was absent, they were never missed. Um, different kids would take turns leading them and writing them down for the class. Um, sometimes I would share with one class what another classes were, created a real sense of community and bonding within each class and within the broader choral community as well. I would be lying if I didn't tell you that I was nervous about starting this with my students because, uh, you know, like why it, it, high schoolers at that point and even middle schoolers, right? If you're doing this with middle schoolers um, and I've done this with adult choirs as well, they can be like wonky about that kind of thing, especially trying something new. Um, and that's where I think for me, having practiced it personally, that made all the difference because I could speak to it from a personal buy-in and, and place of power because I knew the benefit and the effect. So um, that helped me be a bit ballsier in, in going to them um, and talking to them a, about this. And, and this is why more than ever, I think if you are interested in beginning or developing this practice, now is the perfect time to do it as we approach holiday season, um, particularly holiday rehearsals because they're stressful. You have not had a holiday performance, chances are, within the last two years. And even though that's not a long amount of time, it is a long amount of time. And like, you know, kids forget how to stand, much less walk on risers, much less like remember all the things that we ask of them to remember in a performance. And rehearsals can be stressful and time can be cut short. And you will be tempted to not bring this in to a rehearsal. And I think that could be one of your biggest losses because what you want at the end of a rehearsal, in my opinion, uh, is very different than sometimes what some of us experienced as singers. Um, and I know some of us, myself included, have practiced as choral conductors. And that is, um, particularly when you have those really rough rehearsals, there is at times a tendency to say, to be really hard on the singers and to say, oh, this is not to the level like tomorrow you should have known this or you should know this music or I expect this or I expect that. And um, and there is just this huge like narrative of like wanting to, quite frankly, and beat down the choir students so they feel more motivated to go out and practice uh, before the next rehearsal. And the longer that I've taught, the more I've seen how unbelievably ineffective it is. And I actually saw a rehearsal a while back ago where that was like being involved in it. And I like, oh, it was very hard for me to sit through um, because we don't operate like that anymore as a world, as a society. Um, and that is how we were taught a lot of times and maybe not all, but um, we've all probably been witness to that. Um, and that doesn't work anymore. We cannot be so harsh on singers and expect that to motivate them to want to put more into what they're doing. It just doesn't work that way. Um, shame is not an effective tool. And it's been a tool in the choral rehearsal space and musical rehearsal space and performance space for many, many, many years. And daily gratitudes eradicates shame. It eradicates shame from a rehearsal. And when we bring shame into the rehearsals, we bring in this sense of I'm not good enough, blah, 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 blah and all this like negative self-talk um, that does not help anyone. Um, and so I think what's so important is that every singer, no matter how hard or rough a rehearsal might be, because Lord, we're all going to have really rough rehearsals, particularly as we near concert season. Um, we want to inspire singers to return. We want to inspire and motivate them to return. And in order for us to do that, the most effective way is for us to honor what has happened is for us to look for those moments of gratitude and reflect on them. I am not going to be excited to go and practice 15 measures of a song that I know I've screwed up. If I know someone's like going to yell at me potentially about it, even if I still don't get it right, but 
what if I remember that in measure 12, I distinctly remember having a conversation um, in class about how we needed to fix something right. And someone said a joke and someone laughed and I was grateful for that time moment. I'm more apt to go back and want to revisit that moment in a rehearsal so that I can make sure that it's right in the future. And if you don't have a moment for daily gratitudes at the end of a rehearsal, you might not be privy to reminding ourselves of the positive experience that happened amidst uh, perhaps just the cluster of a rehearsal that was around the broader piece that you might normally be expected to go and rehearse or expect singers to go and rehearse. Um, I've seen this work. I've seen this work um, because our psyche affects our teaching. It's all connected. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, you've had really bad days and you come in and you take that out on the students unwittingly or knowingly or meaning to, but it happens. And sometimes you have a really bad day and you come in and it totally turns it upside down or, or vice versa, right? Like you can have a really hard day with students and then go home and it can be the same or vice versa. But bottom line is it is all connected um, and we have to build moments of connections for our singers now more than ever, and those connections have to be positive. Uh, there's too much negative crap going on in the world for us to not be diligent about leaning in to how we can build positive moments of connection. And uh, I will say, I, I talk about this in the new course that's launching January 1st. Um, it's teaching choral musicianship 101. It's really for us to, the first part of it is examining uh, how and why we teach the fundamentals of choir, why we do that, um, because chances are we're teaching like we were taught. Um, and even when we try to do the opposite, there's things about it that still like ingrain itself within us. Um, and so not only did that not necessarily work then, always definitely doesn't work now. Um, and so we'll talk about that there. But the pandemic has also showed choir teachers everywhere how dependent um, many singers are on the choir teacher being in the room with them in the rehearsal. And, and while that there's nothing wrong with that, um, it doesn't support actual musicianship. And, um, and that's something that we are going to address within the course, but I call that out here because when you are asking students for feedback in a daily gratitude sense, you will not always find out things that they got right. You will also find out things that they got wrong. And oftentimes I would learn way more through this practice about how I needed to structure something the next day or reteach something or something that I thought people had, they didn't have, etc. cetera, um, by what was shared vulnerably in the ending of the rehearsal of the daily gratitude portion. But if I had asked that, um, I would have never seen it. And it, probably would not have seen it, um, even if I was just observing, um, because there's so many things that we miss through just observing, I'm using air quotes, as I said, just observing uh, within a, a choir rehearsal. And uh, there are things that we need to give our singers space to share with us about that. Daily Gratitudes does that. Um, I have more examples of how what we will do in the course um, fits into all of this as well, but I, I want to close out by reiterating the place of where this came from, and it was darkness and despair um, in my personal life that was also affecting how I was teaching and how I was showing up, and um, I read a book that talked about the practice of these daily gratitudes, and building it in personally uh, also helped me build it into my rehearsals. And by the point that I knew that I was possibly going to leave teaching at some point when we sang that November at the Music Educators Conference in 2018, I didn't know that I was going to leave the next May by any means. I, I was not expecting it to be that soon, but I knew that I was feeling called to do something different. Um, I, I knew that I wanted to make the best use of every single rehearsal that I had with the singers and get the most out of it as possible um, because one day I wouldn't have that. And this practice helped me do this. It helped ground me. It helped center me. And it also helped ground and center my students. And I know some of them still uh, do this to this day. And it's the biggest gift that you can give um, everyone 
And I genuinely believe it accelerates the progress that you make in rehearsals. Daily gratitudes accelerates what you do in rehearsals by giving you that ending recap of what's happening, help you thinking about what's coming up in the future, hearing what's important to the singers as well. Um, and it's all because you are building in those moments of daily connection. And again, I said it earlier, I'm gonna say it again in closing. Now, more than ever, our singers need to feel connected, not just to one another, but to themselves as well. And I, I hope that if anything, you will consider adopting this practice personally. And if everything, you will adopt it personally and bring it into your rehearsals because it will change. It will change your life. It will change your rehearsals. Uh, and I think that it will certainly help you hack the hecticness of what is this upcoming concert season for the holidays of 2021. My name is Beth Philemon. Thank you so much for listening to the Choir Baton podcast. I am so excited to share with you what is going to be happening for the rest of this month or rest of this year in 2021 and looking ahead to the future within 2022, new courses, new offerings um, to help you get more people singing and to help people get themselves singing as well. Um, the next couple of podcast episodes um, are, are going to be talking about a recap of the most stressful time of the year, um, tips to help you simplify and hopefully, I made this word up, de-stressify uh, what you are doing in the month of December. And the episode after that, I'm going to be talking about, I love teaching choir, but dot, 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 what if you are um, considering leaving the classroom? And I touched on this a little bit in this episode and actually in a previous episode uh, with a friend of mine who left teaching to now pursue um, photography. I am not out in this world to try to get people to leave from teaching choir. Hear me say that. That is not my end goal. Um, but I do believe that um, if you are feeling called to do something else, that that is possible. And quite frankly, you can be both and. And I want to talk to you about um, if you are considering leaving, how you still have to keep choir involved in your life. And you can keep choir involved in your life in a variety of different capacities. And if you are the person that's not leaving or has no plans to leave, no desire to leave, or you can't leave, um, but you see all of your other friends leaving and, and those emotions and stuff, we're going to talk about that in that episode, because um, even recently I, I mentioned to a friend about something and, and they were like, oh, I was at a, a conference and several people were asking me about it. So whether or not people are leaving or not, it's being talked about, um, and we're going to talk about it here. The following episode is uh, The Show Must Go On. We're going to talk about planning for a spring concert season, and uh, we are going to end out the year of the Choir Baton podcast uh, with my top New Year's resolutions for every choir teacher going into 2022. So um, a little preview of what is to come. Make sure if you want to download the template um, via Canva that you can make. It's what I used with my singers when I was doing daily gratitudes. You can go, link is in the show notes for that. Um, if you want information on the Choir Baton new course that is coming out. If you are listening to this for the last week in November and the first couple days of December, uh, there is a Cyber Monday week special uh, going on. So make sure you also click on the link on that in the bio. And together, let's get more people singing. 